Okay, here I'm back um, at the remote terminal. I'm just going to turn the PC on the Pentium 4 that's got the image of Linux from scratch 5 with the 2.6 kernel installed. <clears throat> so while that's booting, I'm going to log into the Pentium Pro 200 server, which I Oops, which I need to piggyback on to get into this machine remotely. Okay, and then I should be able to get into, I have to probably put in the Let's try P233. And I'm going to have to change the IP address because it's obviously not P233 anymore. So my, I don't know what I keep typing SSH in for. Uh, SHH. Yeah, it is working okay. Uh, right, okay, yeah. There's no kernel text on the rear. It's, uh, it's only root because it's a freshly built LFS system. Okay, so there we are, LFS5. Now let's do a uname and check. Yes, we've indeed got a 2.6.22.5 kernel. Um, there's the uh, name that's been appended that I've put into the kernel. So that's looking good. Um, now let's look at the CPU info. And yes, you can see there's the two um cores if you like um not real cores because it's just hyper threading single core um but you can see there it's got two siblings uh one core this is physical id zero and core id zero and you can see that this one here oh okay i thought that changed zero two zero one Okay, I thought there's an oh there it is there at the top. I, uh, processor identification. So there's processor zero and processor one. You can see it's a Pentium four CPU, three gigahertz. As I mentioned, it's a Prescott core. It's the two M. Uh, is it two M? Yeah, two M core. Um, so it's one of the early Pentium fours that's capable of sixty four bit. But although there's a slight mention of sixty four bit in the six point three manual, there's no catering. For 64 bit at all in the build instructions. In fact, I'm not sure how that gets resolved if I carry on building, if it's going to be 32 bit all the way, or if the cross compiling is capable that, that Linux Scratch does is capable of building a 64 bit out of 32 bit. I don't know. Um, probably not, because I'd imagine you'd have to start off with a 64 bit, 64 -bit kernel um, to be able to do that. So that might be um, another interesting problem I've got to fathom out. Um, so yes, you can see we've got the Instant Scratch 5, we've got the updated kernel, and we're on the um, Pentium 4, the newer machine. Um, and in fact, the um, building of bin utils yesterday, if you remember I said it took 3.5 minutes on the Pentium 4 when I... Uh, was testing this out um, and if you remember it took 30 minutes to build it on the Pentium 233 MMX um, so you can see there is an order of magnitude of approximately 10 times the speed so it does mean this build is going to complete a lot quicker um, which also means I'm going to run some tests but only the tests for the tool chain just to validate that I'm not going to be bothering with the tests for the um, uh, lesser tools the minor tools um, so one thing I've got to do is, um, let me see what should I do first. Yeah, I think I should change the IP address of this. I'm actually using the correct IP for this machine. Cause if I, for example, fancied transferring a file from the Pentium 233, to the Pentium 4 that they've currently got the same IP address and that's not going to work. So what I need to do is to 
Um, well, one thing I will need to do, if I go back to the Pentium Pro, is I'll need to modify the uh, config file to enable me to access uh, this machine remotely, as I've done here. So basically, I need to copy all of this. So what's that? Uh, let's put a line in there. So it's 14 rows. If I do 14 YY and then paste that there, oops, and change this to, um, I think it should be 44. I can't actually see that anywhere. Oh yes, it is 44, yeah. So the IP address for this machine is 44. The host name is P4-3000, uh, I think it was. Let's check that. Uh, P4-3000, yes it is, and change this one as well, P4-3000, okay so that should mean I can still get into either of these machines remotely from this box, so that's done. Um, Next, I'll uh, log in and I'll make the same settings that I've made previously to the bash profile just for, okay, they're already there, so that's good. Don't need to do that. Um, okay, now I think in the previous video, I actually mentioned that all the requirements are there. Um, but I think I was incorrect in that. I think TAR is the only package that's out of date. Um, uh, let, let's start working through it. We can see that because I think the host system requirements, yeah, fairly early on in the early books. So you can see there's all the requirements there. Um, so let's copy the script in they've provided to help check those versions rather than explain how to check for them, I've given the script. So if we just go through that, we should see that everything's up to date. As I say, I think TAR is the only thing that's um, just a little bit out of date. Because the bash is okay, they're the same. In fact, no, the bash we've got is slightly newer, it's got a B suffix there, but in reality, it's the same version. Um, bin utils we've got is 2.14, we need 2.17. Bison 1.875, that's exactly what we've got. BZIP2 is identical, Core Utils 5 is identical, uh, Diff Utils 2.8, we've got 2.81, so it's slightly newer. GNU Find, we've got 4.120, that's exactly right. Gork 3, we've got Gork 3.1.3, .3. GCC 3.3.1, and it needs to be 3.0.1, so that's newer. Um, the C library, glibc, we've got 232 and it needs to be 2.25 or higher, so that's okay. grep 2.5, we've got a new one, 2.51. gzip, we've got 135 and the requirement is for 124, so that's fine. Linux kernel 2.6, where well, you can see we've built that yesterday in the previous video. And as it says, it's got to have been built with 3.0, GCC 3.0. I don't think it will actually build if you try to build it with an older compiler anyway, um, if I can remember in the dis long distance past. Um, make 3791, we've got, where are we? 3.80. I seem to remember there's some bugs with that 3.79.1 anyway, um, or at least 3.79, so um, it's good that we've moved on to another version. Um, patch 254, that's the same, said 407, requirement is 302, so that's new enough. And as I say, TAR, the requirement is for 1.14, and we've got 1.13.25, so it's probably only a, 
couple of minor versions behind, but um, due to the fact that it is behind, what I'm going to do is start by building tar first before I do anything else. For two reasons, really. I mean, to be quite honest, tar, if it's not going to work, it's probably going to spew out an error um, if it's not if it doesn't understand a um, tar ball at all. So it probably wouldn't be a problem to go with that. But the reason I am going to rebuild it first is a small reason for that reason, but the main reason is just for convenience because the newer tar, tar 1.14, nose can auto detect the compression used on the tar ball and will therefore um, extract it correctly without me having to tell it whether it's a gzip or um, a bzip2 file so it's just a matter of convenience it just means i won't have to put a z or a j in the extract command um, so that's more the reason why i'm doing it but i suppose it would be quite right and the right thing to do to ensure that that is up to date so as I say, we'll be um, building that first of all before I do anything else in the book. Um, another thing I did think about overnight was the fact that the bin utils that I built temporarily for building the kernel to allow the successful build, arguably I could have built that in exactly the right way um, for building the tools, i.e. bin utils gets built first which is a good thing because the Linux headers may not work um, soon after that, the extraction of the Linux headers. Um, but I could have built it in that way, left it in tools and used it out of tools. So I could have actually started the build possibly and used that BIM new tools. The only caveat is that it would have been built for the Pentium 233. And while that's probably not a problem, um, we are on a different architecture now. So I would have to have rebuilt it anyway. Um, and also the fact that a, a bin utils already existed in the tools, would that have had an impact on rebuilding bin utils? Probably not. But by doing the way I did it, I'm actually starting off afresh with a fresh tools uh, subdirectory with nothing else in it, as the book um, would expect. Anyway, the instructions expect that you're starting out afresh. So um, it worked what I did, plus it means that we've come to the build fresh. Arguably, yes. What I'm about to do with TAR is a similar thing, but at least the TAR is being built for this architecture and not the Pentium 233. So let's go. We know what we need to do to get going. Let's get through the manual and start building, or at least start, start setting up. So you can see this is dated 28th of August 2007. Um, so it's ne nearly eight years on from the first version of Linux Scratch. Resources, help, preparing for the build. Right, here we go. So creating a new partition. So that's something we need to do, I think. Let's have a look. Yeah, we've got... Um, oh, no, that's right. Yes, I did create it because we've got all our stuff there, haven't we, that we were doing yesterday to create the kernel. So... In theory, I should be able to mount that um, slash dev slash SDA. So all the um, partitions we're using are SDA because they're on the SATA drive now um, rather than an IDE drive. Um, and the SATA uses a SCSI sus subsystem, which is why the SDA is the designation used. Um, this is still a version of the kernel where the CD-ROMs are referred to by the HDA designation, the CD-ROM in this machine is connected to the parallel um, ATA, the um, IDE port. So it gets the designation of HDC, I think. Um, but obviously in future versions, um, everything everything becomes SATA, so everything becomes SD, um, ABC, etc. And I think CD-ROMs eventually get their own designation. Is it SG, I think it is, um, as I remember. Um, but I'm hoping we won't need to access CD-ROM with this. It shouldn't shouldn't do so. It shouldn't be a problem. But yes, I've got to remember that everything's SDA now uh, when dealing with disk partitions. So mount SDA at LFS. And if we CD into LFS, we can see there's our directory we use to develop um, or to rather to build 
the Linux kernel and it's obviously still got the bin utils that we built as well, especially to build that or to help building it. Um, I don't need that stuff, but I'm going to leave it there for now. Um, it's probably something I'll get rid of when I come to do BLFS, I guess, because uh, we're not stuck for disk space by any means, but it might be an issue um, when I come to do BLFS 6.3. So I'll leave it there for now. It won't interfere with anything we do, so it's not going to be a problem. So we don't need to format the file system. We've obviously already got that there. Um, we should have a um, swap file. I just activated them anyway. It didn't look like anything happened there. Uh, swap on, that's what I wanted to do. Right, that doesn't work yet. Uh, obviously, in later swap ons, you can just do swap on it and show you what's um, available, uh, what, what's been activated for the swap. But prior to that, we have to actually look at the proc file system to find uh, what's activated. You can see it's already been loaded there with priority one, so it has actually been mounted via the FS tab. Mount a new, new partition. Well, we've done that, so that's okay. We've activated the swap. Packages and, packages and patches, we've got them already in that directory, so I'll just move them across. So let's create the sources directory and change the ownership of that, or rather the mode, the access mode. There's all the packages, all the patches, and I guess now is a good time as any to get those packages into here. So let's have a look to see where they are. Um, LFS 6.3 packages. So I think if I move all of that into here, In fact, I'll copy them in case I'm, I'm always afraid of deleting the package. And I do do that sometimes when I'm not thinking. Um, so copy all those packages into this directory here. Yeah. And as I say, I'll probably delete that directory when I come to do BLFS anyway. So and as you can see, this is a lot faster. This machine, the disk is obviously a lot faster. So that's copied a lot quicker. I did notice I've put an MD5 sun there, so I'm going to run that. Um, I didn't notice that that's in the manual, so I assume that's something I've created. It looks like this might be my own collection of packages. So I'll just run that. And yes, looks like everything's there. So that's fine. So obviously we've got LFS set because it's in the bash profile of the root user. So now we're gonna create the tools directory and create a sim link to it on the root. Okay, that's because I realize why that's there now. It's because that's the tools that's left over from the previous build so that'll have that'll be the tools for the Linux from scratch build stage so I need to delete that that's no use to me anymore so now let's recreate that link and that's worked adding the LFS user so this is all very familiar now. So change the ownership of the tools directory, change the ownership of the sources and become the LFS user. So now we set up the LFS users environment. and source that 
and we'll check we've got LFS still as the LFS user we have so that's fine um, one thing I'm going to do because this is a machine with more than one core available um, not physical core but logical core um, I'm going to set the make flags to run um, to run the builds with two cores now the, the, I did this when I was testing and I got no problems didn't get any problems at all building there were one or two packages that um, aborted with an error because the dependencies of the packages being built or sorry the programs being built um, couldn't be resolved so I just resort, resorted to rerunning make just on a single thread so I'll do the same thing like I say I didn't have any problems at all with the build doing that um, I'm not sure if it's mentioned about doing that in this particular version I know there's well I seem to remember some cagey remarks about running the builds in parallel in later versions but certainly in the most recent versions of LFS it does seem to be encouraged so I'm going to edit the um, bash RC file and just export make flags equals minus J2 to use both cores and resource that so that's there so hopefully that will get used and improve the compile time a little bit so about the SBUs we know all about that test suites I'll say I'm going to run test suites for the tool chain because um, obviously it's in incredibly important to the rest of the build um, but not for the rest of it uh, just to save a bit of time especially some of the packages like the auto make or auto um, conf they take you know less than a minute to build but the tests take uh, a disordinate amount of time compared to the build so as I say just save some time so once again let's just check this prefix is configured in the variable it is and well pin utils would normally be the first package but as I say I'm going to build tar first of all and it just means I can have to rebuild it again and in actual fact the build as you can see is um, pretty standard anyway so let's change into LFS sources so if I do XVF tar as usual it fails so I'll specify the compression used let's run the configure Okay, it's done. So I'll start building, and if I can log in quick enough, uh, so it's going to be the old address still because I haven't rebooted. I should reboot actually. Yeah, it's finished sooner than I'd hoped, actually. Um, okay, not a problem. I'll run this make check just to ensure that that has actually been, been built correctly. Again, it shouldn't take too long on here. I'm not sure if this will be run in parallel. No, there's no indication of that.
Okay, so that's finished, and you can see that six five tests were successful and seven were skipped for um, some reason. So that's all good. We can install that, and I'll tidy that up, and we can finally start building the system in anger.